my name is Bill Hamilton. I've been doing UFO research for the past 38 years. My current area of research is in the Antelope Valley area, where I've been investigating UFO abduction cases, UFO sightings in the skies over Lancaster, and the existence of underground tunnels and bases and secret projects involving advanced technology and alien presence on our planet. I hope you enjoy the presentation you're about to see. We want to go back in, in time here, first of all, to give you a little bit of background on the early crash retrievals. In order to do that, I selected the story of one particular man who I talked with for a period of about two or three hours in a parked car with the outside of his home with the doors locked and the windows up. You see these people get very nervous about talking about something like this. And uh, I call this man Mr. H in my book. He was in the Army, a private in the Army, stationed at Roswell in 1947-1948 uh, time period. And uh, he had participated uh, as part of his duties with the CID at that time in two crash retrievals, not the early Roswell retrieval in 1947, but one that occurred, he said, in 1948 and in the following year in 1949, and both in the um, relative same geographical area which was out on the San Augustine Plains near Socorro, New Mexico. Now, on crash retrieval number one, they were bussed out to the site in a school bus with darkened windows. When they got there, they saw the, the disc was sitting on the ground. It was illuminated by floodlights. The disc was about 30 feet in diameter. He said there were two alien pilots recovered from this disc. One was alive. Doctors were walking the live alien around for about 12 hours trying to save it, but it died. The disc had one round room with a central column in it. This is uh, the uh, waveguide uh, within the craft directing the gravitational wave field out and around the craft. Um, it took only three men to lift this disc. It was so light onto a low boy truck. And he accompanied this disc when it was transported over land to the Nevada test site at the Groom Lake Complex, which was a fledgling complex with only about five buildings out there at that particular time, no underground installations. Uh, when he arrived, um, he arrived there for a debriefing. Now, one of the things he told me is they arrived at night and when the truck lights fell on this one particular hangar, uh, he was astonished to see two live aliens standing outside of the hangar. They were about five and a half feet tall. The hangar doors were opening, and he could see that there was also a special opening to the sky within the hangar, and they were going to take the disc and store it in this hangar and there were already disks stored inside of the hangar, I believe about six of them. This is absolutely amazing when you consider this was 1948. So there were previous recoveries and uh, they had taken these recoveries up to the Groom Lake complex. Um, he was brief debriefed at a long table along with the others on the retrieval team. And something odd happened at the time that he was being debriefed. Uh, he was looking at the wall and he saw pictures of, on the wall, of at least representatives of six different alien types. And as he was looking at the wall, he saw coming through the wall floating through it, 
one of the small EBE type aliens holding a black box in the palm of his hand, of which Mr. H referred to this black box as an augmenter. He was amazed because he could see this alien floating right toward him, looking directly at him. And up to that point in time, having uh, participated in this recovery, uh, he was not alarmed. He wasn't upset or anything else. But this really upset him. <laughs> uh, when he went for meal break to the cafeteria, he noticed that there were areas designated for humans and other areas designated for aliens. The six races of aliens he claims to have seen are the human, the orange race, the tall grays with long noses, short grays, and uh, another type that looked something like the photos that was used in Aviation Week, and an unknown type. He commented that humans and oranges could mate one of the types wore a hand beam weapon on a belt. On crash retrieval number two, the disc was approximately 100 feet in diameter. This was in 1949. There were 10 dead crew. Uh, they were about five foot eight in height. Their weight was no more than about 55 pounds. He carried one body from the craft and said it was dressed in a one-piece suit. He said they later found out that the suit was fastened on via Velcro-type fastening method. Uh, the big disc had a conveyor apparatus on the floor that moved the aliens around from one instrument location to another. One of the instruments appeared to be a gauge of some kind. Uh, the disc had rectangular partitions. It took six men to lift the disc onto the low boy truck. He said the metal could not be marred. He saw one other craft, but it was only uh, by accident, and that was when he was uh, briefly at uh, Wright-Patterson. Um, oh, I believe a couple of years later, before his tour of duty was over. Now, uh, in my crash retrieval file, I have listed dates and locations of 25 crash retrievals. A lot is unknown about several of these, and we're unsure and along with the number of bodies that were recovered at the site. Uh, this is a kind of a collection of data, okay, about these crash retrievals that occurred from a number of investigators and researchers who had heard about one or another. So it's all just listed here uh, without any attempt to validate whether uh, there might be some false listings in here, okay? I feel Mr. H was very sincere uh, about uh, the events he participated in, and I heard a kind of a pattern that I have heard elsewhere uh, among people who participated either in crash retrievals or on what I will call alien-related projects. And uh, there's a pattern to this kind of thing where they're bust out and they uh, to the site with uh, windows that are blacked out or they're flown on an airplane with blacked out windows. There's a minimal of talk communication. You know, there's no small talk. You don't talk about, well, what's going on here? You know, does anybody know anything? Uh, you know, and try to get people to talk. There isn't that kind of talk going on. The only kind of talk that is going on is hand me the screwdriver or whatever it is or the flashlight or whatever instrument and it's just held down to a minimal level. So uh, naturally what I find out is that the people involved really know very little outside of their own uh, particular tasks about what is going on, the big picture. Now the thing is, obviously it was becoming a problem accepting all of this. Uh, 
storing these craft, storing the bodies uh, in buildings on the surface of the ground that would be vulnerable uh, to all kinds of damage. I mean, you know, somebody could look uh, eventually, of course, with spy satellite systems and, and, uh, and uh, these kind of things and advancements in technology. Uh, other countries uh, looking in on us, other foreign agents or whatever, could discover uh, what we were doing, you know, that we were storing these types of craft. So um, I'm sure that sometime in the 1950s a plan was devised, maybe even before that time, to start building extensive underground installations and to store some of this stuff in underground uh, installations and to create research laboratories so that these artifacts could be studied. And probably another priority was to establish communication with the aliens. Now, obviously, some communication with the aliens had already been established as early as 1948, if we consider uh, Mr. H's story and any other uh, corroborating uh, testimony of that nature, then uh, this is very astounding, okay? Um, some of the early records, it was said, have been taken to other sites like Los Alamos, Sandia, um, Wright-Patterson, and stored in a special building there. Now, I know that, and I have some of the documents in my files, that the RAND, or the United States Air Force commissioned the RAND Corporation to conduct a study. This is back, the first proceedings on this were published in 1958. We only have available the proceedings from 1959, which show that almost all the expertise from various corporations were, were gathered at a symposium to study uh, the feasibility of constructing what are called deep underground facilities, uh, not something that's only uh, 10 or 20 feet below the earth, but we're talking hundreds to thousands of feet underneath the surface of the earth. And uh, in the proceedings, Rand concluded that uh, not only was it feasible, but with advancements in tunnel boring and shaft sinking type of technology, we were virtually opening up a whole new world under the earth, similar to the exploration of the ocean or uh, the expansion of aviation or the exploration of space. So it's absolutely fascinating. And of course, uh, the, re the proceedings contain uh, a lot of data about uh, problems in the construction of these underground facilities, such as ventilation and uh, pollution of the air supply, uh, water supply, uh, how to connect various galleries one to another, uh, transportation systems, all kinds of things were figured out back in the 1950s. Also, we know that Area 51 uh, had, as, as far as I can document or tra track it back, had some of the first underground facilities constructed there in 1951 by uh, Navy Seabees a battalion of CBs that went in there to dig and create underground areas. And uh, possibly, uh, and 51, in fact, was a kind of a hallmark year in uh, Air Force um, investigation of UFOs and what have you. So uh, it just came to my mind that uh, Area 51 also probably refers to the year 1951, uh, one uh, project the so-called Project Red Light was established up there at the Green Lake Complex. And uh, <clears throat> the red light, by the way, uh, had a kind of a dual meaning. It had one of these things where um, it had several meanings to it. Of course, Nevada's known uh, for its red lighthouses, so to speak, but 
the red light in this particular case dealt with uh, something like heat lamps because there was supposedly an area constructed, uh, a habitat uh, for uh, a particular type of alien in which they had to use uh, these red and infrared lights in that particular area. So it's kind of interesting. At any rate, there is a tremendous consistency of description that I have heard from various people concerning uh, certain aspects of these underground facilities. And uh, to give you a little bit more insight on that, one very famous uh, underground facility is located at Mount Weather in Virginia. And uh, it's located 47 miles west of Washington, D.C., in rural Virginia. And it's uh, kind of, uh, it was designated as part of the uh, a federal relocation center as part of the continuity of government program. You know, it's very interesting. We don't know too much about this continuity of government program and their subterranean installations other than a few publications about it that have come out. Uh, one of them, I believe I brought the article with me, was published in, uh, it was the cover story in U.S. News and World Report on August 7, 1989, called America's Doomsday Project. And in here they detail um, what's called the Defense Mobilization Planning System Agency and special teams as part of the COG plan equipped with war plans, military codes, and other essential data that would accompany each designated presidential successor to secret command posts around the country. And then it goes on to say, besides the president and other officials designated as successors, the Pentagon has developed COG plans for evacuating an additional 46 key officials at any time of the day or night. These 46 named in the Joint Emergency Evacuation Plan, or JEEP, would be moved by helicopter to bunkers and command posts. Each has been issued a JEEP-1 identification card. Most of the JEEP-1 card holders are military officers who work for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. An additional 248 JEEP-2 card holders, disaster relief specialists, senior, senior Pentagon officials, and others would be airlifted to bunkers and command posts, but only between the hours of 9 and 5. An attack after business hours would mean Jeep 2 card holders would have to get in their cars and drive to their designated <laughs> locations. In all, more than 1,000 political and military officials have been deemed important enough for continued operations of government to work evacuation. And this is all uh, managed by the uh, federal uh, Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, and the Pentagon has divided the country in 10 different regions, among which there may be as many as 50 different fallout resistant command post bunkers, each linked to the others by satellite, ground wave, and high frequency transmissions. Uh, theoretically, any secret command bunker could be used by the president or his successor during or after a nuclear strike, allowing COG planners to play the ultimate high-stakes shell game. So um, that's part of an article that came out that was very revealing. And then um, there is this <coughs> other older article that was published in 1976 in The Progressive on Mount Weather in which it gives a very interesting description because we're going to hear similarities to this description uh, related to bases connected with alien technology. Um, Mount Weather was equipped with such amenities, now this is underground, as private apartments and dormitories, streets and sidewalks, cafeterias and hospitals, 
a water purification system, power plant, and general office buildings. The site includes a small lake fed by fresh water from underground springs. It even has its own mass transit system, small electric cars that run on rechargeable batteries and make regular shuttle runs throughout the city. These same little electric cars have been reported at other underground facilities, including the one at El Mirage Dry Lake, the one at Belsey, New Mexico, and I'm sure also at the Groom Lake Complex, I'll call it, because in fact there are several underground areas there, including an entire underground city approximately 40 miles uh, into the test site above the Mercury Base Station. Okay, and I have talked to somebody who drove into this underground city uh, and talked to the security personnel there. He was uh, buying tires, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, there's various uh, people uh, that are allowed uh, on the test site uh, to buy equipment from time to time. And uh, this person had already had a track record of working very sensitive areas. So I guess he was pretty much clear. Uh, but he found out, uh, just talking with the uh, security man there, who probably shouldn't have been telling him very much of anything, that there was an entire population of people living in this underground city who never really came up to the service. And they sent their children to schools down there. So what are they doing? And are, is this underground population uh, recorded on the census of the United States. And uh, what kind of economy do they have, and is it a parasitic economy, or has it been a parasitic economy? How can they grow their own food, et cetera, et cetera, right? Mount Weather and the 96 Federal Relocation Centers scattered across the countryside. Now here it says, in an older publication, 96, not 50. 96 federal relocation centers scattered across the countryside in Pennsylvania, Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland, and North Carolina make up what the FPA calls the Federal Relocation Arc, a system of underground shelters assigned to the various departments and agencies of the federal government. Now, weather is the operational center. There's much, much more to this, but the bottom line on it to what's going on at Mount Weather is that through the years of Mount Weather system, its computers, its surveillance technology, its scores of relocation centers seem to escape congressional oversight. Good grief, how can those guys miss this thing? And in the process to have eluded the traditional and increasingly persistent call for public accountability. The program has no official charter. It runs without any set of stated rules or regulations. Its surveillance program still remains secret, even from leaders of the House and Senate. Ford administration officials have refused to comment directly and clearly on the subject of Mount Weather's dossiers. To its credit, Mount Weather seems to have steered clear of the abuses that have been linked to the CIA, the FBI, and the National Security Agency. There's no hard evidence that Mount Weather has been used for the political benefit of the incumbent president. But the experience of Watergate and all of its related abuses should compel Congress to take a long, careful look at this unobtrusive but potentially powerful program. The danger of abuse is clear and present, as it is in any institution that is exempt from accountability. It would be ironic to discover someday that our continuity of government program has not provided continuity at all but had been the instrument for discontinuing open and democratic government, that the very program designed to protect Americans has actually been turned against them. I'm going to talk now about another base. And I'll have you hold your questions because I'm going to provide time for questions and answers toward the end of this. And uh, I think
think we're in here for how long? Two hours? About two hours. Hour and 45 minutes. Hour and 45 minutes. Okay. So we'll probably have about uh, 30 to 45 minutes for questions and answers. But I do want to get some of this, impart some of this to you. Now, one of the particular installations that has interested me is uh, this Northrop facility they call the Ant Hill that's up in the Tehachapi Mountains, right up here in the Antelope Valley off of Highway 138. And since the summer of 1988, I have been investigating this facility and asking questions about it. And when I looked into the missing time case there uh, that happened to Ray and Nancy back in 1988 and uh, with the overflight of the boomerang-shaped UFOs, I became very, very interested in it. And then I heard a report that one local man who has a property on 170th Street West out there reports seeing the ground open up like a missile silo within the fenced perimeter. And he saw a flying saucer emerge from the silo and take off. I told a friend of mine about this, and later the uh, Air Force Office of Special Investigation at Edwards, where the man worked, told him to shut up about what he had seen in the Tehachapi's. I have since found out that the local man is known as Chuck and was a contractor on the underground tunnels at this secret facility. And the facility is codenamed the Ant Hill, just like ants making tunnels in the earth. The tunnels have round doorways with panels with red and green lights for ID and entry. There are no doors, but some kind of field is projected from cylinders embedded in the door wall. Tiny globes or orbs hover and followed Chuck and his crew around. These globes were referred to by the Air Force as probes and obviously employed levitation technology. Um, another friend of mine who I call my super snooper uh, has been out to the Tehachapi site. And on two occasions in July and August of 1990, uh, photographed the hovering orbs outside of the facility. And he described the orbs as sun golden color and brilliant. On the second occasion, he videotaped the movements of these orbs. These orbs have a tremendous luminosity, and they do not reflect this luminosity off the surrounding terrain. Now, what's really interesting about this is recently it was reported in Science Digest, which I subscribe to, that scientists had succeeded in shining a laser light through monoatomic gas, okay, because they had another laser tuned to a frequency which inhibited the quantum mechanical process of photon absorption of the monoatomic gas, all right? Uh, what this means is that all gases are tuned to uh, or I should say, all atoms are tuned to light frequency so that they can absorb photons of light and re-emit photons of light in scattered directions. Well, this was very interesting because the scientists went on to say uh, they could see no limitation to this process. They could see no reason why they could not use a molecular gas or a liquid or a solid and maybe perhaps someday shine a light through an obstruction like a wall. And I found this extremely interesting because, of course, we know about UFO light phenomena that has appeared over the years. The uh, alien technology is such that they have a tremendous control over light phenomena. In fact, I was witnessed this, I have witnessed this myself back in, I think it was 1978, one apparently a UFO came flying down my street because it was flying down the street. I f first took it to be a fire engine. <laughs> in other words, it wasn't in the sky. It was flying down the street with red lights revolving and everything else. And it was only maybe a moment later that I realized I heard no sound at all, no motor sound, no siren or anything. And this thing whirled off to the left 
and I think started to ascend. And it wasn't but a minute later that a pulsating beam of light of some kind was coming down the chimney and was uh, flashing in my fireplace, and I could see it, and the beam was truncated. See, if we take a flashlight, if I took a flashlight and put a beam on that wall, that beam is not going to stop until it reaches the wall, right? And it's not going to stop in midair. So how can they, you know, and, and these light beams have been seen to bend from UFOs. They have been seen to go out slowly, you know, at, at a slow crawl, and they had an end to them. I mean, something like the lightsaber, right, in Star Wars. So um, here we have another light phenomena with these patrolling orbs, as I understand it, and they are sensors. They're surveillance orbs of some kind. And I have seen these orbs also myself in the mountains around that area, and many people have seen them patrolling around the, the Northrop facility, the Douglas facility, and the Lockheed facility. Now we have an informer. An informer came forth through an intermediary who worked uh, at the Ant Hill on Project StarTalk. He comes forward and says, well, they worked, their work there was involved with lasers. He worked in a big building. It was about 350 feet or more. This building is embedded underground. He described a laser that goes through a tripod and strikes a mirror. The laser is modulated with a message as it strikes the mirror and it's sent into space. It's a guidance system to bring in UFOs. He also worked at the Douglas facility. He saw a UFO land and, take, and was taken down into an underground hangar. Inside the underground building is a huge computer complex. The workers wear white clothing and white socks, no shoes. The computers use a symbol language, and manuals indicate the codes to be entered. There is a large Lexon plastic screen in the room that displays various star systems and galaxies. A wax pencil is used to indicate targets for the laser. The technology is so far advanced that it is beyond our known engineering technology. Somehow the laser is accelerated beyond light speed and interdimensional. Security guards accompany all workers, even to the bathroom. His phone is tapped. It took him two years to get a high security clearance. Um, another man we nicknamed Gopher, another informant, is a brilliant computer specialist and works at even higher levels of security. He worked at the Ant Hill and also at Hellendale, as well as the Nevada test site. The government paid for his divorce, alimony, and child support. He says that we are working with aliens and alien technology, and it scares the hell out of him. He makes $145,000 a year. He doesn't have a life of his own. He has seen reptilian aliens and graves. His work with light-skinned reptoids. Graves are strong and intelligent. He has also seen the orange race, a lot of them. These have been uh, described to me by all informants as looking identical to the people portrayed on Alien Nation. I don't know what to make of that. Um, he has seen no benefit to humanity but he is trying to find out what is going to happen. He is worried about what the future holds, says he foresees an alien war. They live in underground condos. They have swimming pools, saunas, and a gym. They have a parking lot underground. They work 14 to 16 days. They are not allowed to leave the country and must get permission to leave the state. The main control center is below Haystack Butte on the rocket test site near Edwards. A tunnel runs from Haystack Butte to the underground Ant Hill facility. He has also encountered and heard of a benevolent group that he only refers to as the Federation. Some of these are looking human aliens who are trying to 
write the conditions on planet Earth. One of these he described as a tall blonde with a white jumpsuit and a green coat over it. He believes these are friendly beings. So we have a very complex situation going on here. One female or male. Male. Now, um, just a couple of other items that that kind of brought to mind. A little interlude here. Um, we have an underground facility at the Tehachapi's. We have an underground facility at Douglas near El Mirage Dry Lake. Also under a false dairy farm out there. Also at George Air Force Base. Also at Edwards. Also at the rocket test site and also at Helendale. <laughs> this is just California. Okay, and there's an extensive system of tunnels that connect the various installations. Um, transportation is sometimes by ground vehicle, electric car, or by, if you will, a magnetic train that runs through a partially evacuated tube at very high speeds. Uh, there's no mystery about these underground trains. Uh, there is, um, I think his name is Frank Davidson. Well, I have his name here somewhere. He's a professor at MIT, and he wants to bring the underground tube system into the commercial sector and build uh, a coast-to-coast -coast system, 1,500 feet underground. However, uh, the military, a uh, government, uh, tube transit system and interlocking network of tunnels already exists all over the United States. Here's only a portion of them as revealed to us by in insiders. And this is also published in my book of the Southwest area. And that may not be all of them. Um, recently we heard that one of the vertical shafts that intersects some of the tunnels was discovered by a man out there near Highway 395 back in 1985. Now, what he did was he got somebody with a cable and sat on one of these little seats and was lowered down this 40 by 40 shaft and he took a lantern with him, and at about 50 feet down, he encountered a tunnel. I think was, I'm not sure what the dimensions of the tunnel were. I think 12 by 20, but I'm not sure of that. And he'd go down some more in another tunnel, and he kept going down until he reached uh, the end of the cable. And still, he had not reached the end of the shaft. Now, at a certain depth, and I'm not sure how far down, 500 feet or so. He said there was a lip around the entire tunnel, looked something like titanium to him. And there on down, the shaft was lined with this titanium. He decided to be pulled up again, but he decided he, he could dispense with the lantern because he wanted to see how far the shaft went down further. So he let go of the lantern and watched the light as it spiraled down into the shaft. But it went out of sight, and he never did hear it hit bottom. I've had friends of mine go out to investigate <coughs> this particular shaft, and they have seen it. I, uh, in fact, they asked my super snooper to go out there, and he verified it. And I said, well, did you take pictures? And he said, no. <laughs> and he takes pictures of everything. He didn't take pictures of this. But... Apparently, they're intending to go back and lower a video cam with a light on it on a cable so we can get video recordings. However, one of the guys that was working on this, he talked to a couple of people who worked on tunnel projects, and they told him, oh, yes, uh, we'd go down in the state of California, come up in Utah and take three weeks' leave and go back down in Utah and have to come back up in another state and what have you. And he said, you probably discovered one of the uh, sh connecting uh, vertical shafts that was not capped off. And he says, I'm sure that we capped them all off. So I don't know what happened to the cap on that one. Well, this guy is another super snooper that was looking around, and he's gotten into a lot of trouble because he goes right up the fence lines and uh, <laughs> out into places where he shouldn't be 
And uh, the last I heard was uh, they decided to buzz his house with a black unmarked helicopter, and so he's kind of laying low right now. Um, but he's found out a lot of interesting things on his own. And he delivers uh, uh, construction material. He's a construction worker uh, to the Ant Hill facility. So he's been up there and he's seen the openings into the underground. Okay, so um, let's get on with the story of the Dulcie facility, uh, which I became intensely interested in about three years ago when I took a trip to uh, Dulcie, New Mexico. And it's a sleepy little Indian town on the Hickory Apache Indian Reservation up there. And I believe it's somewhere around 5,000, no, more than that. Somewhere between five and seven thousand. I mean, the elevation up there is tremendous, and uh, lots of snow for many, many months at a time. And uh, I was conducted on a tour around uh, the Delsey area by State Police Officer Gabe Valdez back in April 1988, because I wanted to ask him about the sites of the cattle mutilations and what he had observed and if he had seen any UFO activity, if he had seen any evidence of getting into entry to uh, underground areas. So he was most helpful. And then uh, I was trying to analyze and get opinions about uh, the controversial uh, information that was released by scientist Paul Benowitz, who uh, back in 1979, 1980, claimed that he had established communication with uh, little gray aliens at this underground facility up at Dulce. Now, uh, of course, uh, since that time, and uh, Paul has had a lot of trouble, and uh, he has written a book about all of this, and uh, there is a recent article in UFO Universe about the mysterious Paul Benowitz. But he has been debunked uh, by such uh, researchers as Bill Moore, who feel that Paul Benowitz did stumble into something, but he was fed a lot of disinformation. Well, I happen to differ, uh, in my opinion, uh, from Mr. Moore, um, in that I think he really did stumble into something, and they just tried to divert his attention away from it. And um, some of the people that were involved in chasing Paul around were with the National Security Agency and the Department of Energy, because the underground facility there at Delta is run by the Department of Energy. And the Department of Energy is part of the U.S. intelligence community as is the State Department and the Treasury Department, not just the CIA and the NSA and the FBI and what have you. There's, there's many things like this. This can be verified, if you will, go down to the library and look in any U.S. Naval Intelligence Manual, and you'll see. Department of Energy is on the organization chart. I mean, it's little things like that, right, that we should become familiar with. And I find that very interesting since, of course, the Department of Energy controls the Tonopah test site on the Nevada test range and um, probably several other areas that we would like to know about. Now, let me describe as Thomas, well, maybe I should tell you the story of Thomas S.C., and I do know his last name. I know where he was born, his date of birth, his social security number, everything. Okay, we're looking into all of this. This is a Xerox photo, although not a very good one, of Thomas C. Okay, taken back in 1979 when he was working at Section D. This is a very poor <coughs> photo just one of many that he took of the hematology or blood lab at the Belsey facility. I'm sorry it's such a poor copy. This is 
a drawing, and you could look at this closer if you want, of level one of the Belsey complex. I have a drawing of all seven levels. I've been told, I've not been told to release the other six yet because there was, we have some key information here in case somebody else comes out, right, and says, well, there's this and this and this in these underground facilities and these coded colors on this level and everything else, right? You go, that's right. We got the baseline information here. And that correlates. How did you know that? Right, unless you were there. <clears throat> well, there was one thing we were sitting on concerning the elevator system. <laughs> There's many things we're sitting on, but one of them was how the elevator system in this facility, right? And uh, I was uh, having a little conversation yesterday with uh, Jim Cox about this man, Connor. And suddenly Jim blurts out about the elevator system over the S4. And I about, my jaw dropped when I realized that he said the same thing and it was constructed in a similar fashion as to the one at Belson. So um, I'm tending to believe that there is <coughs> probably uh, something quite substantial to this new case, and I'm eager to hear more about it so that I can evaluate it further. Um, let me give you uh, a little verbal description here. It's a cylindrical underground facility consisting of seven levels with radiating tunnels and transit systems. Each level has a ceiling of seven feet, except level six, and seven, where the ceilings are 45 and 60 feet, respectively. There's approximately 45 feet between each level. The first level ceiling starts at 200 feet below the surface. The average highway transport tunnel ceiling is 25 feet. The hub at the base is 3,000 feet across. The base extends 1,700 page miles under northern New Mexico from Belsey to Los Alamos and has another 800 miles of tunnels running west. The base is still growing. 20 miles north of Belsey is a large hangar hidden by a facade of cliffs. The ventilation shafts are hidden by bushes or vents inside caves. There are five atop the Archuleta Mesa. Security cameras monitor these. There are many types of sensors, radar, infrared, microwave, electromagnetic ground wave, and satellite. Now I'm going to come back to this in a minute, but before I do, I want you to feel the reality of this story. And I'm going to read, if you'll bear with me, it's better if I read it as much as possible. The story written for me, and this supersedes all previous editions that I have given of the story of Thomas and his involvement. <clears throat> it's a story written by his best friend who I had a privilege of talking to on several occasions. It is a woman. Thomas C. has a passion for antique cars, any antique car, but especially Packard's, but mostly the big nose cars of the 40s and early 50s. A lot of his spare time was spent modifying his 1949 Packard, and he needed special parts. His friends told him about an older man in a near town that had a machine shop that could rebuild antique cars. He found Ed West to be easy to talk to, not just about cars, but about anything. Soon the two spent countless hours discussing cars, planes, and the space program. Tom and Ed quickly found they, both, they were both fascinated with flying saucers. After a few months, Ed introduced Tom to the organization a group that did deep research on flying saucers and contactees. Tom completed the initiation, and soon he was doing several assignments at the same time. At that time, 1961, he was in the Air Force, stationed at Nellis at Las Vegas, Nevada. 
He was schooled in photography, receiving a top secret clearance. He was given the chance to receive extra training in West Virginia. It was there that he first worked in an underground base. When he left that facility, his top secret clearance was upgraded to TS-4. <laughs> Meanwhile, his duties as an Air Force sergeant include photographing a runway exercise in Florida. He took advantage of the off time to meet one of Ed's daughters, me, that's the person that is, that lived in Orlando. Tom was pleased to discover that I drove a Packard, a 1950 straight eight, whose hood sported a beautiful smog. The friendship began the same day. The next year, 1963, I got a divorce and moved to Las Vegas to be near with my folks. Back in Florida, I had experienced a close encounter with a glowing flying saucer, and the haunting dreams and memories were bothering me. It was Tom that introduced me to the organization. <clears throat> After a few visits, I was initiated, and I began assignments for that group. Tom and I began collecting books, articles, and magazines about UFOs. Many times we spent half the night doing research. Over the years, Tom became the brother I never had. We had a lot in common. He was only a few months apart in age. His parents were killed in a car wreck when Tom was a teenager, so he looked up to my folks and even called them mom and dad. Hopefully this is something that will appear in a future book we're working on, or we're going to put this all together. Thomas stayed in high security photography for seven years. Leaving the Air Force at the end of 1971, he began working for Rand Corporation as a security technician here in California. Within one year, his TS-4 clearance was upgraded to Ultra 3. When he met Kathy in 1972, we all knew she was the woman Tom wanted before he admitted it. I stood beside Kathy when they were married the same year. It was spring 74 when Tom told us that in seven months there would be a baby. On November 7, 74, Eric Scott C. was born. No new daddy was happier than Tom. He gave out cigars to everybody. In 1977, they moved to Santa Fe, New Mexico. Tom had been transferred, and his clearance again was upgraded, this time to Ultra 7. Though he told me he found his new position financially rewarding, he discovered there was more stress. <clears throat> he told me that he worked underground, an incredible security in and for the photography department. His job included all of the aspects of photography from large format cameras to mini cameras. It was his responsibility to check, align, and calibrate all the security video cameras from the doors to exit tunnels. His position required that he be armed at all times. Two, it was uh, it, was job to, it was his job to escort visitors to certain areas of the base. When he finally left the Dulcie base, he had earned the security rank of major. Um, in the spring of 1979, I drove to Santa Fe and visited them. Tom seemed more intense than he used to be. I took him aside and asked him if something was wrong. He said he wished he could talk to me about the things that worked to bother him but he couldn't go into detail because of his high security clearance. The day I left New Mexico, he pressed a folded piece of paper in my hand in a quiet way that no one else saw. He hugged me and whispered quietly, don't let anyone see this. I slipped it into my pocket. That night alone at the motel in Durango, I quietly opened the paper. There were three things on the yellow page, a sketch of an alien, an inverted triangle, and the name Dulcie. <clears throat> I stared at the mysterious drawing, trying to figure out what it may mean. The alien in the picture had a large head, big black eyes, no nose, and was bald. The triangle was shaded black, and I knew I'd seen that shape recently, but couldn't remember where. I turned on the faucet, soaked the paper, and flushed it down the toilet. That night, I had nightmares about aliens. <clears throat> in the morning over coffee, I looked at the map, trying to decide what route I would take back to Vegas, suddenly I noticed a small town near the New Mexico state line called Dulce. My heart jumped, memories of the sketch flooded my mind. Is this what Tom was trying to tell me? <clears throat> Thoughts raced through my mind. What is going on in that tiny town? Are there aliens there? What does the triangle mean? Then I remembered where I saw the black triangle. It was on a hat on Tom's coffee table. 
It was burnt orange with a black inverted triangle with gold bands cutting it in three sections like an upside-down T. I knew I had to drive through that town to see what I might find, but there was nothing different or suspicious that I could see. It looked like any small desert town in any desert Indian nation. I put the doubts in my mind aside. Whatever time was trying to tell me would stay a question in my mind for months to come. I went back to Durango and drove to Cortez. I fell in love with that town and knew that this was a hometown I wanted. That fall, I moved to Colorado. Early in December, Tom made a surprise visit. He told me that a couple of months back, he'd walked out on his job at Dulcie Base after a major dispute between the security workers in a military group. Tom said the security force used flash guns, but the military group was armed with machine guns. He said it was like a war with screaming and panic in all the tunnels. A lot of people died in the conflict. He wondered how the government will cover up all those deaths. He told me to watch for it in the newspaper. In February 1980, the media reported on a prison riot near Los Alamos resulted in many prisoners dead. True prison story or Dulcie Wars cover-up? Tom admitted he was in trouble. He said he went back to the base hoping no one would see him and took photos, papers, and other items. He said he entered and left through a ventilation shaft inside an ice cave, knowing there was less security there than any other place in the base. After leaving the cave, he returned to a prepared box, put all of it in the box and buried it, then went back to his car, but the security guards were waiting for him. They questioned him as to what he was doing there, but allowed him to leave. On that cold December visit, he told me he was on his way to Colorado Springs and was on the run and it was hard to keep one step ahead of the group that was looking for him. We discussed the things. He said he left in a box near the ice cave. He described how he slipped into the area and retrieved the box with the camera and other things. Tom asked me to have faith in him and that no matter what I may hear about him, I should always remember that he is the same man I've known for years. That evening after dinner, he made several collect long distance phone calls. I know he called someone in Idaho, but I have no idea who or why. That night he slept on my sofa, but left during the night. I was really worried. I called Kathy. I knew something was really wrong when she called me by the wrong name and asked if she could call me later, but she never called again. The next day, three men from OSI questioned me about Tom's whereabouts. Four more times in December, other men questioned me, wanting to know more about him. I told them I didn't know anything and said I'd call him if Tom calls me. January, found the CIA on my door. I lost track how many times they questioned me. They insisted that I have more information than I'm telling them. Maybe they were right, but the stress was beginning to get to me. My head ached constantly. I had been in a car wreck in the middle of 78 and had headaches a lot. Those headaches seemed to be bad. At the end of January 1980, my doctor ordered some tests in a Farmington, New Mexico hospital. Early in February, I entered the federally owned hospital for an angiogram, a simple test that should take about an hour. Something went wrong, bad wrong. I woke up from the test to discover I suffered a stroke. She believes, by the way, that this is an artificially induced stroke. She said she had looked, awakened in a room where about the only thing she recognized was the bed and the TV set. Everything else looked like the medical uh, uh, deck on, uh, on the Enterprise to her. Tell them anything, not for a long time. It was June 1982 before I heard from Thomas. He called me from my dad's. We talked for hours. He'd been in 20 states and four countries, and he'd been running for his life. He was in big trouble, and they were trying to kill him before he could tell the world what was going on in an underground base. He told me about his Ultra 7 clearance. I tried to understand what he was telling me, but a lot of it was too deep for me due to my stroke. I couldn't understand the medical papers or the scientific diagrams, but I had no trouble understanding the videotape he showed me and no trouble seeing the graphic photographs of alien creatures and hybrid life forms. Slowly over the next three days, he made me understand his grave situation. 
He told me all about the Nightmare Hall area. His vivid descriptions of the suffering people in the hideous cages overwhelmed me. He told me that many times the people spoke foreign languages. Some spoke Spanish, some Japanese, and some didn't speak English at all. These were men, women, and children of all ages. These were incarcerated uh, down on level seven and was the site that caused Thomas to doubt what he was told in his briefings. I asked who is doing this and why. Tom told me that our government has a treaty with an alien country and the aliens have been on this earth for countless centuries. He showed me pages of alien written material in the translated papers. I was horrified and terrified when the abominable truth sunk into my reeling brain. I've known Tom for many years and have never had a reason to doubt his word. When he told me that Kathy and Eric had been kidnapped and were being held in the subterranean base, I knew he was telling me the truth. <clears throat> he asked me if I would help him. There was no hesitation. I would do anything I could. He needed a safe place to hide all the original papers that he took from the Dulce base and the other things he gathered to prove there was an alien conspiracy. I knew the perfect hiding place. Well, the rest of this is they had all the material put in a container, went to an associate at EG&G and had it specially wrapped. Then they took a road off into the desert, into rugged territories near a mountain, went up about 6,000 feet and buried it at a certain location at the foot of this mountain. And I have been to this location is recently, <clears throat> well, first went there about a couple of month, months ago to do a kind of a recon of the area and kind of judge what we would have to do to hike up and recover the material. Thomas has now authorized us to recover this material and make it known to the public. But it is the most rugged, most hazardous hiking territory I have ever seen in my life. And why he chose that area, I don't know. I wish he would have hidden it somewhere closer to ground level because I don't think anybody could have found it anyway, right? Um, <clears throat> last weekend, we came probably within 100 feet of the location. All the markers were seen, and probably the only uh, fruit of our efforts was Thomas's old shoestring was recovered from the site. <laughs> Apparently, it broken off his shoe up there. Uh, <clears throat> my partner, I think, is going to try to make an attempt again about another month. Um, we're keeping uh, the location right now secure. We don't want any interference or trouble. I'm not saying from friends, <laughs> but uh, we feel that we have uh, discussed this enough that we're sure that they're aware of our activities. And in fact, when I was discussing this news case over the phone to my associate, uh, there was a buzz on the line. And uh, at that point, I heard a familiar sound which told me we were on tap. <coughs> at that time, we started yelling into the phone about, <coughs> well, whoever out there is listening, <laughs> you want to hear something good, want to hear a good joke, <laughs> or whatever, right? They get tired of this. Um, there are many levels of security clearance, by the way, um, with code words above top secret. Um, the one that uh, Thomas held was above top secret. It was ultra top secret, ultra level seven, and he was cleared for security on all seven levels of this particular facility. Now, I've also talked to an engineer, uh, and I have his resume, I know who he is, and uh, he's been to an underground nine level facility out at Palmdale, and he's also told me about advanced technology. I'd just like to repeat uh, one thing that he told me, and that was, if there's anybody here that doesn't believe in aliens, then they've got a big surprise in store for them. 
some of the levels above ultra that uh, Thomas mentioned to us were Umbra, Stellar, G27Z, Triad, Universal Military Training, Universal Military Service, Astral, and Subastral. And there also there's Magic. There's also something known as Cosmic Top Secret, by the way. And that is a valid level, but it was more used in NATO than over here. There are grazing reptilians in the underground facilities. The reptilians have their own base called Duke Dugout Dutch or Dross, indicating draconium. The Drax use a symbol of a dragon with its tail in its mouth, circle with seven pointed stars in the middle. They stay near the surface. They choose to hide and avoid contact. They are soldiers doing a job, and usually there are two or three at a job site. They are not to bother humans unless the humans are endangering their post. Most of them are not hostile and won't kidnap you, but may blast you with a flash gun that may paralyze you. It causes a temporary blackout. The reptoids speak and their voices are harsh and whispery with heavy S's. They are stronger than humans. They find humans smelly. If you see one, approach it only with arms down, hands open, and palms facing forward. If you fight your fear, he may talk to you. The best defense against grays is mental control. Strong or bright lights hurt their eyes. They avoid the sun. Nonsensical words will confuse them. I've abstracted these from answers that Thomas wrote back to me, questions that I directed to him. The aliens have mastered matter, he says. They can go through walls like we go through water. It is not magic, just physics. We can learn to do the same thing. It has to do with controlling atoms at will. There are other things uh, about the Dulce facility, the electric carts, colors, levels, insignias, and stuff, detailed information that we're holding in confidence until we can get others who want to come forward and we can verify this. Uh, one other item about that particular facility, we found that the water supply is through the Azotea Tunnel, which feeds water from the Oso Diversion Dam in Colorado down a 30-mile long tunnel and empties the water into Lake Heron in El Bato. More water enters this tunnel than exits, of course. Water is said to be used by the underground base near Delcy for water and power purposes. Here's another little uh, story that adds to that. There's a tube shuttle that runs between Los Alamos and Section D, which is Delcy. Now two security sources revealed that a multi-level tunnel system exists below Los Alamos. Level 1 runs under Main Street. One block from the Pan Am building is the old high school now used as an engineering facility by Macon and Hanger, originally the Zia Corporation. Inside the facility is an elevator that descends to the computer room. From the computer room, a side tunnel intersects the main tunnel transit tube that runs from Los Alamos to Albuquerque. These levels are protected by pro-force security. At deeper, more secure levels exist automatic devices that kill intruders. A security guard accidentally tripped an alarm one time and was killed by one of these. These tunnels are a minor part of the vast network of such tunnels. One other thing mentioned by these two sources is an underground city that sported a population of thousands who occupied condo units. Many of these people live permanently underground. Some of the advanced technological research going on involves genetic labs and laser fusion. The budget for the service facility is a billion dollars per year, but there's many times that for underground research projects. So I'm going to kind of uh, arbitrarily wrap it up at that point although there are other little tidbits and much more to discuss here, in order to open it up to some questions from you as to what you would like to know more about concerning this. And I saw your hand go up first, so I'll point to you.
of government? Right. Probably this continuity of government program and on the underground shelters. Six o'clock is what I understand. So, well, um, again, going back to like this Mount Weather facility and the continuity of government program during a federal emergency, and that's anything that they designate to be an emergency. Uh, there will be constituted a parallel government, right? A kind of a successor government. That is, if they can't get these officials, whatever people, you know, have that uh, clearance card down into the underground shelters, uh, they have people who are designated to replace them and continue the operation of government. There's, there's probably much, much, much more to it than that. Um, so Mr. Chandler just rushed on that, I think, and during the North proceedings, and he was cut off. That's, that's on video. He asked about the <coughs> alternative constitution that North had helped work to set up that was part of an alternative governmental plan, and he was just quieted by the head of the panel. If you want to work, by the way, on one of these underground projects, you're welcome to. You will have plenty of safety in the future, no freedom. If you don't mind that, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a brand new issue. This is uh, allegedly uh, a secure. She's asking about a man named Connor. I refer to a man named Connor. That's just a pseudonym. He did give out his real name, Derek. Okay, uh, his first name. And uh, he says that he worked at what? Derek Hennessy. Okay, Derek Hennessy is his full name. All right. So why shouldn't I tell Thomas his full name? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody will ask, right? Tempt me. He said he worked at the S4 facility, Nevada test site level two, where there's an area called a museum with saucers. Aliens and capsules, etc. And he's a renegade. He's left there. He says he has photographic evidence. And they're chasing him all around the country trying to retrieve it. Let's cross her phone. Yeah. So, how many people are in this room are going to be real up close to him so you can listen to what he says? Huh? <laughs> when the bomb goes off in the room, huh? Out there. <laughs> all right. Many people talking about the size of the underground bases and the towns keep on telling you bigger and bigger. But yet, I don't hear everyday people that like do hauling jobs and pull dirt away and deliver construction equipment. Like the Alaska pipeline, everyone that did that mm. kind of work was gone for a year. They were up there making that money. Right. And these things are so huge that they're, ha I mean, they just don't put people in the CIA and have them dig tunnels. No. Um, Where do the people that actually do the hard work? I have met I have met construction workers that work on the phone. Enough of them to account for it. That's what they need yeah, to do. No, just a few. Just a few. Right. Okay, one of them that I knew worked for Santa Fe International. All right. Um one of the things you have to realize is this is not an ordinary contract for working on the Alaska pi pipeline. Okay, this is a, a contractor who, by his record in the military or whatever, okay, is cleared for top secret work. But they get these guys to so they're not going to, uh, and they're not going around talking about their work. You understand that? Mm -hmm. See, once I put out the word, I have had people like that approaching me and just telling me all kinds of weird stuff, just like something he just mentioned there. Uh, these people are out there, uh, but they feel intimidated. Now, I'll tell you, in fact, I was talking to an uh, um, electronics technician that worked on black projects. And it wasn't alien related. It was 
like this side of the dividing line, advanced technology, okay, his phone was tapped. The security guards walked him to the bathroom. They looked over his shoulder when he was working on printed sword circuit boards, okay, things like this. They talked to his friends to see if he was saying anything, all right? It's more severe when you're in the alien technology areas in that you also undergo drug and hypnotic treatment. I know this is amazing, right? Okay, back there. <clears throat> well, in some of the, over at El Mirage, we saw huge mounds of dirt. It's right out there. You can photograph it. I mean, it's not hidden. And uh, down the Tehachapi, there's a huge wash of the uh, this plastic cement that they use as a binder in uh, building construction. And it's, it's actually toxic to the environment. My friends out there have lodged complaints about it, but they won't do anything. So you could see evidence of this stuff out there. Now, the, the reason why the mounds of dirt are, are visible out there on the El Mirage area is because that's a flat area out there. And you could see this huge movable building at the Douglas facility, and this building moves like on, whether it's on rails or wheels or whatever, but there's a huge crane inside this building, and it's lowering stuff into the underground facility. Okay, but you know, and that's visible. But here's the strange thing: sometimes at night, there's something that comes up from the ground into the building, and the doors are open, and suddenly the top of it ignites with this tremendously brilliant light. And it's so impressive that one of my super snoopers said, said that he felt like getting down on his knees and worshiping it if he was, you know, of a more primitive bent, right? Because the, in, the interior of this building, he said, remained dark. You know, if you turn on the light in the room, see all the light reflecting off the walls, right? So definitely definitely eyewitness evidence of advanced technology in a known aerospace company complex. I have a question about this. I've read a number of conferences that they have been very easy in the Well, if during the course of the construction, I'm sure that if they ran across any of these and uh, they were still usable, they'd probably try to make use of them. But I've heard that there are more of those down in South America. And there may be some up here in North America. I don't know. Um, I, know, I know it's hard to say uh, thoughts <laughs> on such an I don't know. I keep thinking about <clears throat> the movie Star Wars. <laughs> you know, um, there is something. Let, let's call it this. We hear a lot of things. You know, Alternative Three, by the way, which was an April Fool's joke. Uh, at least the television broadcast was done on April first. By the way, all with actors. Some people are asserting, are asserting otherwise. Okay, but. There is a concept given that I think is legitimate in the alternative three concept, that there is some kind of a crisis, okay, like say the ozone depletion or whatever. What are our, our options? And there were three options given. Alternative two was to build underground shelters. Alternative three is to get off the planet, live somewhere else, live on another planet, terraform Mars or whatever, right? Well, I'm just saying, in, in a particular case where there was some kind of a, a crisis happening. Now, the rumors that I hear, and they're only rumors, so I don't want to panic anybody and say, oh, the sky is falling. Maybe it's not. I don't know. All right? But we've heard a number of things. And we had one informant who I guess the FBI cut off. He was with NASA at a secret observatory out there. And he was feeding us stuff, including I've got a Xerox of a photograph of some of the things. 
<clears throat> artificial objects they were photographing in the high atmosphere, but every time I get a line, like on Project Star Talk, the FBI comes along. They don't bother me, see? They go to my sources and snip the line there. Well, they're using, they're using you as a magnet to find <laughs> Right. Who's talking? Ah, they're going to Hamilton or, or somebody else, right? You know? So I'm not the only one, you know, getting this, these kind of informants, see? But I would speculate that there is uh, what I call the terrible truth. This is what I told Linda Howe. You know, she and I spent a lot of time speculating, by the way. We try to keep it out of the public arena. But there's a few things where we throw back and forth and we speculate. But I speculate there's something called a terrible truth that's at the bottom of all this. And I, I know my partner has either been told this terrible truth or something close to him, and he won't even tell me. You know, he was visited, and um, in, in the past, he's, he's been in security projects, and he's been briefed. The briefings he had was all nice and loyalty and all this stuff. But uh, when he got visited by these two agents from Washington, uh, uh, they laid this terrible truth out on him, and he doesn't even want to put his mind on it. And this is a guy I know deals with all kinds of uh, bizarre realities and had a direct encounter with a seven-foot-tall reptilian humanoid, okay? Yeah. And yet he says he doesn't want to put his attention on what they told him because it deals severe psychological damage. What the hell does he mean by this? What is the See? So there's some kind of terrible truth that goes to any length. I don't know. I could say without prophecy, you know, and I don't know how much stock to put in prophecy, but let's talk about prediction. I mean, there's certain trends that are going on right now. We're headed toward an eco-catastrophe. I'm certain of that. <clears throat> yeah, but are we? The thing is, is our momentum uh, such that... Uh, we're just, you know, already part of the railroad train is going off the cliff, so to speak, right? And who's going to grab the end of the train and pull it back up? I don't know. And, well, let's... When this guy, uh, Thomas Lee, smuggled out these documents, why didn't he make an attempt to connect with some type of media to expose immediately? What he did was uh, he made five copies of the documents and got them to trusted friends, okay? And he decided, um, at that time, he didn't know what to do, okay? He was on the run from state to state, and then he left the United States, connected up with a band of a renegade group, okay? And they have their own underground base in another country. And uh, he claims to be in contact now with benevolent aliens that are helping them out, okay? resisting whatever was going before. But I guess he was just running too much and uh, couldn't make the connections that way and uh, just trying to stay alive. And he was also very concerned at that time about his wife and child who the security team took into, uh, they captured them, okay? and uh, we're holding them prisoner, and we're trying to negotiate with them to get the material back. How long have you known where the location is? Not long. I've known that it was buried somewhere for some time, but um, it was only last April that we were given the authorization to go ahead and recover the material and make it public as soon as possible, because Thomas is predicting that there is a a conflict coming up and that we're not aware of. It's going on now, okay, but that we're not aware of it, but we will soon become more aware of it because it will become more overt. There's a, apparently a conflict between different alien groups right here. Your last statement, exactly, that's the one I was thinking of. Uh, several speakers or groups expressed they feel there is a 
Well, the year that I've been hearing about <clears throat> for the past 10 or 11 years now is uh, beginning in 1992. Okay, we're yeah, we're going to see a lot of things breaking out, all hell breaking out, you know, a lot of uh, sightings, abductions, I don't know what the heck is going to be going on, right? So what should we do? <laughs> 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 Have fun. Don't rely on me to tell you what to do. <laughs> Build your own underground base. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, another question here. Let me check yes, the time. I have a, a quick observation followed by a question. I was mm -hmm. very impressed both this time and your earlier talk. You heard the light, bright light, the broken illumination around the capital when I was 16, farm road in Texas in the middle of the night. I felt that the phenomenon. I never forget how impressed I was with how absolutely unchanged it was. <coughs> I passed it the first time and it was so strange. We drove back up there. We didn't take a look. So I know for a fact that can occur, but, um, you know, I just saw it that one time. But here's my, here's my question. Um, I'm sorry that we read this quite interesting. On the other hand, there are people with very good imaginations about it, and I wonder if you had taken the, the other step of checking into the history, present condition, and mental Mm -hmm. um, this isn't only dependent on her. My colleague has met with Thomas directly, okay, bypassing her completely. I mean, other people have met Thomas, not just her. Okay, so the person we want to evaluate is Thomas because he's the one telling the story, not not particularly her. I mean, here, she's just trying to um, tell her side of the story. Uh, in other words, kind of give a character reference for Thomas, all right? Um, it would take a great deal of time and resource to check out people, a great deal. UFO researchers do not have the resources to do this. If anyone would like to donate a large amount of cash, and capital, equipment, and all the means to do this, uh, I'm sure that we can round up some pretty damn good people to start looking into all of these things, okay? Uh, if I hadn't, so I'm limited to contacting a number of people to see if other people are telling similar stories, which they are, and if there's a pattern to these stories, in other words, has one person seen something and can describe something who's an independent witness, being that he's not in contact with this other source at all, okay, and relate the same type of information? There's highly, and there's other approaches to this, too. Uh, I think Right. But here's the key. Here's the key. I mean, we don't even have to believe these people, okay? We know the sites of these underground bases. And we have people hanging around these sites. And what they see coming out of there and going into there is unmistakable. Okay. Okay. We know about blood running underneath the in the tubes and what what countries are the tubes visited? Which countries? Which countries? Okay, I'm not aware of which countries they go to. I saw a map poster that showed tubes around the world. Is it that? I have no idea. All I I'll tell you what the network of tunnels that we have mapped out are merely here in the southwestern United States, okay? And they could have similar in the eastern United States. Beyond that, I have to... Max, if you're not 
no information. So, yeah, there are other possibilities here. I just don't have the data. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we have uh, Nippon yeah. Television is real eager to get it. <laughs> they are all been ready, been waiting for it. Right. Yeah, they're waiting for it. Huh? I don't know. I, I'm not approaching anybody until we got something. Okay. Sedona. In Secret Canyon, yes. In fact, Secret Canyon is the only other place that I've seen the jumpers, uh, the vehicles that I've described in my talk, you know, jumping from position to position, which we see out over in Lancaster skies. The only other place I've seen them is out over Sedona. They strobe and they jump from position to position. Yes, thank you. Clarity on what you said, a nine-level underground station you mentioned briefly was where? Palmdale. Palmdale. Right. And I believe it was under uh, the area of Air Force Plant 42 out there. No. Hey, hey. I, I, you know, this goes on and on. I mean, I've been approached by ex-Air Force officers who told me, yeah, I've been in underground bases and engineers, um, Boeing engineer, Lockheed engineers, um, technicians. Hey, it's starting to add up. No, it's starting to add up. I think I've heard was George Bush, uh, they have the war over there, and George Bush is on vacation. He asked him, George, you're sitting here on vacation. How are you going to know what's going on on the road? He said, you should be able to show that I have facilities here in my vacation site to know what's going on down the road. I show you that little cat in Phoenix in the mountain. It's got to have some tunnel system going drawing right up to it. Well, Okay, let, let's have about three more questions. Okay, first about the, the attitude and the base area of Palmdale. Do you think you can see guys around? Sometimes. There's no guarantee, but sometimes. Uh, <laughs> a lot of times we see the jumpers out there, frequently. I don't, you know, it, I can give you a verbal description, but the thing is you probably wouldn't know <laughs> unless... I started pointing out to you what what it was doing, and you need binoculars, okay, and you need to study the binoculars either on a tripod or on a surface of some kind so they don't jitter around. But they're out there, and there's other things out there that are quite obvious, but more infrequent. Was another question? Mm-hmm. That doesn't surprise me anymore. <laughs> okay. How much time do we have? We Ten minutes. Oh. Then are we okay, we can go on. Say again? Who's the, what? Which ones are you referring to? <laughs> of the UFOs? How many feet above the ground? Where should we go? If you go out to the desert? <laughs> oh no, no, no particular altitude. Okay, I mean they could be at any altitude. If you're real lucky, they can come right down to the ground, take you aboard. <laughs> <laughs> Put out their little tractor beam. Yes, I do. Um, not at this time yet. Probably. Okay, the question was where, what foreign country is Thomas living in now? You know, where, and I don't want to answer that at this time. 
No. I have no idea. Um, not that I know of. So, any more questions? Anybody has? Okay. I'm just curious why you're announcing that you're about to recover the serve. Surely they wanted to go and catch it. So, you know, what you're going to do is more or less. They didn't bother us at all on this last trip, and we announced it. <laughs> you know what? After seeing that area, I, I think they're thinking, why bother? Or let those guys go up and get it, and we'll wait till they get back before we bother them, because we don't want to bother with that. You know? I'll tell, I don't even want to go back up there, I'll tell you. Could be, but like I said, there are duplicates of this material elsewhere, and the people who have it say if they do not hear from him, see, he reports in on a periodic basis. They do not hear from him on this periodic basis. Assume he's dead and get the material out. This would be threatening him Oh, he doesn't care about that anymore now. There's a reason for that that you won't believe. <laughs> I don't know. Look at Donald Menzel. Okay. Oh. <laughs> uh, that was amazing. I mean, here's a guy that appeared, he was an astronomer, a leading, he's a leading astronomer. He has books, textbooks that he's written. <laughs> And he used to debunk, he was before Philip Class, he used to debunk UFOs. You know, ah, they're just barrages of light moving around against the clouds and things like that, right? And then suddenly it appeared, this MJ-12 document appeared, a briefing to President Eisenhower, and Donald Menzel was mentioned there as being part of this MJ-12 team. And somebody says, are you crazy? I mean, here's a chief debunker, right? And Stan Friedman started looking into his background, and here's a guy who was with the National Security Agency, had a top, top secret clearance, knew all kinds of classified information, and hardly anybody knew about it. Working in the public sector, see? So you don't know who might be working there. In fact, the guy showed up at the real estate office uh, out in Victorville, and he heard the woman there who had my book mention Dulcie, and the guy turned white, and he said, what did you hear about Dulcie? He says, I never knew that that was made public, you know, like that. Okay. Yeah, what do you think about the MJ-12 document? Undecided. I think the, that there is uh, such an organization. Yeah. I think it was reported that 66 died. It was 1979. By the way, uh, any data that Bill Cooper's been putting out about this is all screwed up. Because he didn't see it in the documents. He got that information from us. And then he changed it. And I resent that. Let me clarify. So Cooper said it took place between the Elegant and us. Well, he changed all kinds of things about that particular. I'm just telling you what the original information is, and it just seems like every time it gets into Cooper's hands, it gets all twisted out of shape. I don't understand that. We don't know. It was between a, the security group and a military group down there. Now, I heard something. Yeah, humans. But... The security group, like Thomas's group, was armed with alien flash weapons. Okay, uh, this has been described to me as having several settings, but it's they, it's an invisible beam that hits a person, 
And when it hits the person, there's a flash, okay? And the person falls unconscious. At higher setting, he's dead. That's what the flash gun is. Yeah? Do you believe that uh, the pole ship was coming around June 2000? <laughs> These are things I've studied for years, and all I can say about that is I'm halfway convinced that there has been a major pole shift in the past. And, you know, there's been evidence for a catastrophic uh, shifting of the Earth's poles on its axis. You know, it, the orientation of the axis of the Earth is what they're talking about here. Um, so it's possible again. But when is um, a big question. <clears throat> well, whatever the nature of, of the threat is, or the coming catastrophe, if there is a coming catastrophe, uh, something has been planned to shelter people underground. Because I, there's no doubt, I mean, some of these facilities have been described to me as being a, as deep as a mile under the surface of the Earth. <laughs> I thought it came out of your pocket. <laughs> you and me, right? We're funding it. Who? They were held in captivity and used for experiments. He's writing them off. Who are the good Us. <laughs> now, the uh, good aliens appear to be uh, Nordic human types, uh, similar to apparently ones that I encountered back years ago. Uh, <clears throat> they apparently met with some of the early day contactees and told them various stories, probably partial truths and things like that, but they appeared to be friendly and benevolent. Uh, they have distinguishing features. Hmm? Apparently, some of them. No, they're all. You know, they're not all like blue-eyed blondes. Okay, some of them have dark hair. And yeah, but their eyes are are very penetrating. Uh, I believe I. Like I said, I've had an encounter of this type, and my impression was just like what others have told me. You know, I was like a pane of glass that was looking right through me, knew all about me. Good feeling. Oh, absolutely good feeling. Yeah. Sometimes the irises have funny colors, or they have gold and silver specks in them, and they have extremely uh, symmetrical features. They're just uh, perfect human beings. No. No, not when they sit in coffee shops <laughs> and order hot chocolate. I don't think so. I'd go right through a hologram. <laughs> oh, boy, are they telepathic. I know that from personal experience. Hmm? Well, you can talk to, they, the human type, they, I mean, the ones that are like us, they can speak any language. English, German, Spanish, French, Hindu. Yes, I believe I am. They didn't come off a ship, so that's my little reservation there. But they did come into my house. <laughs> they look very much like us, except, like I said, uh, we would admire them because they're in perfect physical shape. Both men and, and yeah, extremely long lifespans. So very translucent skin. Uh, five eight to six two, anywhere in that range. 
not extensive at all. I wish it were. What is your theory about why the government doesn't have access to the notice? That's another thing. This is really mysterious to me. Government's really got a lid. They do anything to not to knock down stories about these uh, Nordic friendly aliens. Why? I don't know. I wish I did. When you find out, let me know. It is a little peculiar in relation to what Michael Lindemann has told us here at the conference recently, and as you uh, mentioned earlier about the spin factor, about how it appears that the information is being metered to us to represent a sort of positive feeling towards certain types of encounters without any insinuation of uh, female, Fireheart, women being related or genetic ranges. So it seems strange that they don't want us to know about, quote, positive, unquote. I don't know. What's our time? That's it. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. I know more of you would want to contact me for more information about my activities or my monthly meetings in Lancaster. And you can contact me at And for further information about my research, you can obtain the book that I have written called Cosmic Top Secret, published by Inner Light Publications, from one of your local New Age bookstores. Or you could write the publisher, Inner Light Publications. Thank you very much for watching. Hi, I'm John Lear. I'm a captain for a major cargo carrier. Please join me with Linda Moulton Howe on One on One. My name is Bill Hamilton. I am a UFO researcher and investigator. I investigate UFO sightings, abduction cases, crash retrieval events, and underground activity. You can see me on tape with Linda Moulton Howe on One on One. Hello, my name is Sherry Stark. I'm the co-publisher of UFO Magazine, the first journalistic forum for theories and reports about UFOs. When Vicki Cooper and I started the magazine in 1986, there was very little, if any, serious reporting on the subject. Basically, it was your tabloid coverage or occasionally a cursory or a comic relief mentioned in the mainstream press. Since that time, there has been growing public interest in the subject, starting with a couple of best-selling books and there have been documentaries, and there have been talk show guests, and a lot of interest and a lot of uh, types of information out there about the subject. But in some senses, it's even more confusing because there are so many different kinds of information that are subjective that the general public often is turned off to the subject as a whole. And what we're trying to do with the magazine is present the best information scientifically that is being shown, the best research, and presented in a way that the general public can access it and have a source that they can trust, that we don't have any vested interests or particular theories that we're pushing in the field. We also have 
like a guide to the best books that are out, the best research that's been released recently, the best cases. We also have opinion pieces, sometimes with theories from different disciplines that might help to explain from a different angle what might be going on. Well, if you'd like to find out more about the magazine, you can send 545 for a sample issue, or you can subscribe for $21 for the year. And you send it to UFO Magazine, PO Box 1053A, Sunland, California, 91041. And if you'd like to call and get more information, it's 818-951-1250. Thank you. This has been a presentation of Lightworks Audio and Video. So we're walking the live alien around for about 12 hours trying to save it, but it died. The disc had one round room with a central column in it. This is uh, the uh, waveguide uh, within the craft directing the gravitational wave field out and around the craft. Um, it took only three men to lift this disc, it was so light, onto a low boy truck. And he accompanied this disc when it was transported over land to the Nevada test site at the Groom Lake Complex, which was a fledgling complex with only about five buildings out there at that particular time, no underground installations. Uh, when he arrived, um, he arrived there for a debriefing. Now, one of the things he told me is they arrived at night, and when the truck lights fell on this one particular hangar, uh, he was astonished to see two live aliens standing outside of the hangar. They were about five and a half feet tall. The hangar doors were opening, and he could see that there was also a special opening to the sky within the hangar, and they were going to take the disc and store it in this hangar. And there were already discs stored inside of the hangar, I believe about six of them. This is absolutely amazing when you consider this was 1948. So there were previous recoveries, and... Uh, and they had taken these recoveries up to the Groom Lake complex. Um, he was debriefed at a long table along with the others on the retrieval team. And something odd happened at the time that he was being debriefed. Uh, he was looking at the wall and he saw pictures of on the wall of at least representatives of six different alien types. And as he was looking at the wall, he saw coming through the wall, floating through it, one of the small EBE type aliens holding a black box in the palm of his hand, of which Mr. H referred to this black box as an augmenter. He was amazed because he could see this alien floating right toward him, looking directly at him. And up to that point in time, having uh, participated in this recovery, uh, he was not alarmed. He wasn't upset or anything else. But this really upset him. <laughs> uh, when he went for meal break to the cafeteria, he noticed that there were areas designated for humans and other areas designated for aliens. The six races of aliens he claims to have seen are the human, the orange race, the tall gray of talk communication. You know, there's no small talk. You don't talk about, well, what's going on here? You know, does anybody know anything? Uh, you know, and try to get people to talk. There isn't that kind of talk going on. The only kind of talk that is going on is hand me the screwdriver or whatever it is or the flashlight or whatever instrument and it's just held down to a minimal level. So uh, naturally what I find out is that the people involved really know very little outside of their own uh, particular tasks 
about what is going on, the big picture. Now, the thing is, obviously, it was becoming a problem, accepting all of this, of storing these craft, storing the bodies uh, in buildings on the surface of the ground that would be vulnerable uh, to all kinds of damage. I mean, you know, somebody could look uh, eventually, of course, with spy satellite systems and, and, uh, and uh, these kind of things and advancements in technology, uh, other countries uh, looking in on us, other foreign agents or whatever could discover uh, what we were doing, you know, that we were storing these types of craft. So um, I'm sure that sometime in the 1950s, a plan was devised, maybe even before that time, to start building extensive underground installations and to store some of this stuff in underground uh, installations and to create research laboratories so that these artifacts could be studied. And probably another priority was to establish communication with the aliens. Now, obviously, some communication with the aliens had already been established as early as 1948, if we consider uh, Mr. H's story and any other uh, corroborating uh, testimony of that nature, then uh, this is very astounding. Okay. Um, some of the early records, it was said, have been taken to other sites like Los Alamos, Sandia, um, Wright-Patterson, and stored in a special building there. Now, I know that, and I have some of the documents in my files, that the RAND, or the United States Air Force, commissioned the RAND Corporation to conduct a study. This is back, the first proceedings on this were published in 1958. We only have available the proceedings from 1959, which show that almost all the expertise from various corporations were, were gathered at a symposium to study uh, the feasibility of constructing what are called deep underground facilities, uh, not something that's only uh, 10 or 20 feet below the earth, but we're talking hundreds to thousands of feet underneath the surface of the earth. And uh, in the proceedings, Rand concluded that uh, not only was it feasible, but with advancements in tunnel boring and shaft sinking type of technology, we were virtually opening up a whole new world under the Earth, similar to the exploration of the ocean or uh, the expansion of aviation or the exploration of space. So it's absolutely fascinating. And of course, uh, the, re the proceedings contain uh, a lot of data about uh, problems in the construction of these underground facilities, such as ventilation and uh, pollution of the air supply, uh, water supply, uh, how to connect various galleries one to another, uh, transportation systems, all kinds of things were figured out back in the 1950s. Also, we know that Area 51 uh, had as, as far as I can document or tra track it back, had some of the first underground facilities constructed there in 1951 by uh, Navy Seabees, a battalion of Seabees that went in there to dig and create underground areas. And uh, possibly, uh, and 51, in fact, was a kind of a hallmark year in uh, Air Force um, investigation of UFOs and what have you. So uh, it just came to my mind that uh, Area 51 also probably refers to the year 1951, uh, when uh, project, the so-called Project Red Light was established up there at the Green Lake Complex. And um, 
The red light, by the way, uh, had a kind of a dual meaning. It had one of these things where um, it had several meanings to it, of course. Nevada is known uh, for its red lighthouses, so to speak, but uh, the red light in this particular case dealt with uh, something like heat lamps because there was supposedly an area constructed, uh, a habitat uh, for uh, a particular type of alien in which they had to use uh, these red and infrared lights in that particular area. So it's kind of interesting. At any rate, there is a tremendous consistency of description that I have heard from various people concerning uh, certain aspects of these underground facilities. And uh, to give you a little bit more insight on that, one very face with long noses, short grays, and uh, another type that looked something like the photos that was used in Aviation Week, and an unknown type. He commented that humans and oranges could mate. One of the types wore a hand beam weapon on a belt. On crash retrieval number two, the disc was approximately 100 feet in diameter. This was in 1949. There were 10 dead crew. Uh, they were about 5 foot 8 in height. Their weight was no more than about 55 pounds. He carried one body from the craft and said it was dressed in a one-piece suit. He said they later found out that the suit was fastened on via Velcro-type fastening method. Uh, the big disc had a conveyor apparatus on the floor that moved the aliens around from one instrument location to another. One of the instruments appeared to be a gauge of some kind. Uh, the disc had rectangular partitions. It took six men to lift the disc onto the low boy truck. He said the metal could not be marred. He saw one other craft, but it was only uh, by accident, and that was when he was uh, briefly at uh, Wright-Patterson. Um, well, I believe a couple of years later, before his tour of duty was over. Now, uh, in my crash retrieval file, I have listed dates and locations of 25 crash retrievals. A lot is unknown about several of these, and we're unsure and along with the number of bodies that were recovered at the site. Uh, this is a kind of a collection of data, okay, about these crash retrievals that occurred from a number of investigators and researchers who had heard about one or another. So it's all just listed here uh, without any attempt to validate whether uh, there might be some false listings in here, okay? I feel Mr. H was very sincere uh, about uh, the events he participated in, and I heard a kind of a pattern that I have heard elsewhere uh, among people who participated either in crash retrievals or on what I will call alien-related projects. And uh, there's a pattern to this kind of thing where they're bust out and they, uh, to the site with uh, windows that are blacked out or they're flown on an airplane with blacked out windows. There's a minimal
Hi, my name is Bill Hamilton. I've been doing UFO research for the past 38 years. My current area of research is in the Antelope Valley area, where I've been investigating UFO abduction cases, UFO sightings in the skies over Lancaster, and the existence of underground tunnels and bases and secret projects involving advanced technology and alien presence on our planet. I hope you enjoy the presentation you're about to see. We want to go back in, in time here, first of all, to give you a little bit of background on the early crash retrievals. In order to do that, I selected the story of one particular man who I talked with for a period of about two or three hours in a parked car with the outside of his home with the doors locked and the windows up. You can see these people get very nervous about talking about something like this. And uh, I call this man Mr. H in my book. He was in the Army, a private in the Army, stationed at Roswell in 1947-1948 uh, time period. And uh, he had participated uh, as part of his duties with the CID at that time in two crash retrievals, not the early Roswell retrieval in 1947, but one that occurred, he said, in 1948 and in the following year in 1949, and both in the uh, relative same geographical area which was out on the San Augustine Plains near Socorro, New Mexico. Now, on crash retrieval number one, they were bussed out to the site in a school bus with darkened windows. When they got there, they saw the, the disc was sitting on the ground. It was illuminated by floodlights. The disc was about 30 feet in diameter. He said there were two alien pilots recovered from this disc. One was alive. Dr. 